Hey everyone, welcome to our NahamCon talk. Uh, this year we're going to be talking about hacking root EPP servers to take control of zones. Um, so this is some work that uh, we've done over the last few months um, and it's been completed by myself, Sam Curry, Brett Bauhaus and Reese Ellsmore. So we're very excited to show you today how we were able to take control of these zones and the impact that it had from a security perspective. Just a little bit of an intro. Um, I'm the co-founder of AssetNote. I've been doing bug bounty for a really long time, um, but in the last few years, I've really been enjoying doing some uh, security research with a group of people, uh, regardless of whether or not a bug bounty is involved. Um, I'll pass it off to Sam. Yeah, awesome. Uh, name is Sam Curry. Also go by the handle ZLZ. I've been doing like kind of security research, bug bounty stuff for I think like seven years now. But I work uh, security at Eagle Labs now. And I guess we can just go ahead and get started with the intro. Cool. Yeah, so to give some context for this talk, uh, I think like a lot of kind of history between like me and Chubbs is spending like a lot of time doing like this like targeted bug bounty work. And a lot of the structure of that is like you find a program, you have to stick to the scope and do like a lot of this like structured testing. So I think after doing like a few years of that, we we're kind of like tired of just like the specific, you know, ecosystem of bug bounty and we wanted to do kind of just more like fun security research. So when we kicked that off, it was kind of interesting because the question became, becomes like, what's the most fun stuff to hack or like, what's the most interesting and like wide scope or like wide impact. And we eventually realized that like a lot of uh, TLD stuff would be like, a, you know, a huge factor for like something that has like a single point of failure, where if you compromise it, you compromise like everything down the line. So we decided to spend like a lot of time doing uh, security research affecting these. And to give some uh, context too, there's a lot of like really cool previous work for like hacking TLDs or CC TLDs. Uh, Matthew Bryant twice has like hit it on the head with just like really, really solid research. We're taking over, you know, CIO, ITAO, .NA, and .IO. Um, and there's also some really cool work by Fred Frederick Almruth. And I'm probably absolutely bludgeoning that name, but just like really, really cool stuff, which is like really inspiring where it's either, you know, a really cool like application security, like, you know, OWASP style, like injection sort of attack vulnerability where you're able to compromise a TLD or it's actual like very specific DNS related issues, which allow like someone just completely compromise the TLD. But like this kind of work and this sort of approach got us like really interested in like doing more. Yeah. And, and most of the approaches um, from my understanding in the past have all been related to like DNS related shenanigans, whether it's returning refuse status and things like that. So this is why I think Sam and I were very excited today to present something that takes a different uh, view on this and, and tries and uh, tries and gets the most impact without even looking at the DNS um, related side of things. Um, so just to, to jump in, um, what's a registry and a registrar? So this is important knowledge for you to know before we start talking about hacking um, CCTLTs. Um, a registry is like the highest level of the chain. Um, they're responsible for managing every domain that's registered within that zone, and they facilitate all the important functionalities such that registrars can speak with them. So if you think about the, the kind of the tree, um, the registries are sitting at the top of the tree. Um, and as you go down, there's the registrars. And as you go down, there's the consumers. So a registry is something like a CCTLD operator or a TLD operator. A registrar is something like, you know, your GoDaddy's, your Namecheap's, things like that. So that's basically what a registry and registrar is for the for the scope of this talk we're going to be talking about hacking registries which is again the highest level of the chain highest level on the tree and that's what we're trying to aim for when we're doing this research the next thing that I just quickly want to explain to you is what the EPP protocol is and what EPP servers are. Now, if you're someone that really doesn't work in the, the TLD space or the domain registry space, you wouldn't really have heard of the EPP protocol. The, the extensible provision protocol is a unified way that um, you know registrars and registries can communicate with each other through exchanging XML messages. Now, it's, it's a really simple um, protocol. It's usually exposed on port 700 uh, and it takes in XML messages. Um, it is something that you know may or may not require authentication through a mutual SSL certificate, but usually you can communicate via XML. And yeah, last thing, it is one of the most critical services uh, in, on the internet because almost every every registry has to run an EPP server, and if you compromise that EPP server, you will definitely compromise every single registrar connecting to that registry and every domain connected to that registry. 
the messages for EPP look pretty simple. Um, just uh, the stock standard XML that you may be used to. I know most of us come from the web application security space. And, you know, the first thing that you might think about when you see uh, an XML message like this is, well, is it vulnerable to XXE? Now, it runs on port 700, it accepts XML messages, and sometimes there's no real authentication before you can send those XML messages. So for the first, for, for that, for the people watching this talk that have web application security knowledge, the first thought you might have is, is it one vulnerable to XXE? And this is essentially the same thought that we had as well. Yeah, so when we found like, uh, that is running on port 700 like something kind of interesting is that like uh if you have a traditional like api that's like accessible over HTTPS on 443 that's a web server and it connects to you know all, all these like online services registering domains chances are people would have already kind of looked at it fuzzed it and scanned it but since it was running on port 700 and had kind of this like uh sometimes required a certificate that was like accessible publicly on the internet you kind of had to like script a specific way to communicate uh with with the actual xml service so what we did when we started testing is just uh, we spun together just a very generic XXC payload, and we found like all these servers running on port 700, um, just a across like a few different places. And then uh, we wrote this Python script to just interact with it and send like a generic XXC payload. And uh, it it basically was just testing for like out of band XXC. So if we got a ping back, we would know that something fired. So when we spun this off, we hit probably you know a few hundred different um, boxes with this, um, just like seeing what exactly would ping back. And I think on the next slide, it shows um, we actually just like immediately got off, like, I think 50 callbacks to like our Burp collaborator. So it's super surprising just that like the very first kind of vector we thought would, would work ended up working. And uh, at this point, we kind of had to go back and trace through like what exact servers were vulnerable, what servers weren't vulnerable, and then kind of like trying to debug, you know, whether or not we had issues with the TLS or issues just like doing the XXC. Um, and as we kind of proceeded through this, um, we actually went forward, and I think on the next slide it'll show, sorry, I'll have to bear with us. We're doing a sort of duo online thing for the first time, so it's a learning experience. But we we, we eventually realized that uh, after 50 callbacks, um, yeah, and on that next slide, sorry. Let me see. Yeah, on the next slide, we, we realized that the, uh, there, there, there are multiple services that were giving us callback pings, and uh, when we took those individual services and we like threw them into like just Nmap and like evaluated like what services were running on them, those devices, we ended up learning that there was different uh, like services running on the devices. So I think on like HTTP or HTTPS, uh, we we saw a service called uh, the COCCA registry software, which was basically just like a login portal to manage the actual like CCTLDs, right? And when we saw that this was running on it. Um, alongside, you know, the service on port, uh, the other port, which was vulnerable to XXE, we kind of decided to like dig deeper and seeing if we could find like a copy of the source or some way to approach this. Because you have these two services running on the same uh, device and one's vulnerable to XXE, the, the actual like web service, right? So we were thinking maybe there's some way we could use the XXE to compromise like a secret from the web service that would allow us to authenticate. And we kind of like pulled apart or tried to find the source. And this is kind of where we got started approaching the COCCA registry software. Yeah, and just one thing to note uh, on top of what Sam said is the COCCA software is something that's used by almost every CCTLD on the internet. Um, it's something that, you know, like one thing that we don't recognize um, often is that these CCTLDs are often ran by small teams, sometimes universities, sometimes private individuals that have almost no resources. They can't create custom software. They don't have the budget to create something that's complex or secure or something that's very, very um, tidy and, and well, well made. They have to rely on ready built solutions like COCCA. And I guess when we discovered this, we were quite surprised that so much of the internet's infrastructure was reliant on this piece of software that's, you know, just like a Java monolith project. And you can see here, the COCCA project is used by .ai, .bj, .bw, bunch of CCTLDs that are managed specifically through this software. Um, so we 
when we reverse engineered the COCCA software, we found that um, it's just one big Java monolith software, but it included the source code for the EPP server as well, which is running on port 700. And this EPP server, um, when it was being um, initialized, uh, a document builder factory is being initialized without any uh, XML entity protection. So in Java, normally when you initialize a document builder factory, you need to specifically and explicitly set it so that it does not expand entities, external entities. And in this case, you can see in this code snippet on the right that this document builder factory has default settings and it doesn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, disabling the external entity expansion. So we were able to really quickly identify the root cause of the XXE for the EPP server. But um, really, we were interested in finding even more vulnerabilities in the COCCA software. Um, so one of the things we found was uh, there was the cities servlet. Now, mind you, there are you know dozens of servlets in this software, but this is one that we found after some time that looked very interesting because it was accessible pre-authentication. Um, so one of the things we often do when we audit any piece of software is we try and understand everything that is pre-authentication. And so we found the city, city servlet and we can dig into it a little bit more. Um, we can see that the city servlet is actually just taking in the request and taking in the parameter, which is country and concatenating that with a file path and then reading that file path and returning it to the user in the response. So. This is a pretty classic local file disclosure vulnerability. Um, and this is you know, something that once we found this, we could combine what we had found with the XXE to read the, 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 the contents of directories, to read the, the file names and list files and directories, as well as with this local file disclosure. If we chain those two together, we're able to now read any file in the system and also understand where all the files in the system lie as well. Um, so this is what it looked like. Um, this was the, the local file disclosure. It's clearly just returning the contents of any file that we request. And this is also where um, a, a huge part of the collaboration came into play. After discovering this um, vulnerability, it was then passed off to, you know, uh, you know, ZLZ, Reese, uh, and also Brett, where they did a lot of the post-exploitation work to escalate this in, into discovering something that was much more significant than just this, you know, vulnerability by itself. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we, we were able to chain the XXE vulnerability with this local file disclosure vulnerability to obtain any file in the system. One of the things that was quite surprising is we were able to even obtain the ETC shadow file, which, you know, to be honest, that means that the, the application is running as root, which is quite, quite, quite terrible, to be honest. Um, and yeah, as, as you guys may already know, with XXE, you can use the FTP trick to read files which have new lines or read contents of directories that have new lines. Um, so it gave us a really good understanding of what was on the file system. And we also had a vulnerability to read any file from the file system as well. Yeah, so kind of as we like discovered the issue and then discovered the impact where it was running as root on all these different systems, we kind of changed our shift to finally like get in touch with the vendor. And when we tried to initially reach out to the vendor, it was kind of tough. So we decided to focus on a specific affected uh, TLD and then find the contact of that TLD and then kind of liaise on to contact, you know, COCCA through that uh, TLD. So we decided that the, the dot AI registry would be kind of like an interesting one to kind of figure out because, you know, tons of people, like tons of these companies are using dot AI for like different companies and stuff like that. So we thought it was just kind of an interesting TLD that would maybe likely have a good contact. So after like uh, focusing on the dot AI box, uh, we kind of went through a couple files and just trying to find someone to contact. And we eventually found, uh, a few files relating to someone named Vents. Um, and as we kind of proceeded through, um, we ended up actually finding like an SSH key and like references to these other boxes. And we've, we, as we, I think proceeded, I think on the next slide, maybe um, it, it details it a little bit, but uh, after reading through like a couple files, we discovered an SSH key that like uh, allowed us to SSH into another machine. and. The other machine actually included like GPG encrypted backups of the entire .ai registry. And it also included like contact information for the actual owner of the registry. Um, so since we had now like discovered the vulnerability, discovered a, an affected uh, user of the CC COCCA software, um, we were actually able to reach out over WhatsApp, to, which which is kind of a funny thing, right? Um, as as Shrub said earlier, right? The idea of like, you have the entire .ai registry, right? Which is like running and supporting all these like different domains and all these different companies are all using it. 
And even on top of that, there's like this little software, which is made for like maybe 20 different, you know, or, or I'm sorry, probably I think a hundred, a few hundred different uh, TLDs um, to use the software. And uh, we ended up having to like reach out to this guy over WhatsApp to get the problem resolved, right? But we ended up, uh, I think on the next slide, we sent Vents a message over WhatsApp uh, just to contact him after finding this uh, PGP file. And uh, while we're contacting him, we reported the vulnerability via just like sending him a document of the vulnerability report. And he was actually able to pass it over to the COCCA team who fixed it. But we kind of asked him a few questions. Um, and just to kind of confirm the impact, um, it was we just basically asked like, hey, if an attacker were able to gain access to the registry admin panel, what do you actually have control over? Like, are we misunderstanding something or is this like full domain takeover? And then basically just says, yes, if you get admin on a web login, you can do anything to any domain. So it's just crazy because like, you know, through maybe two or three steps and a local def file disclosure, um, we're able to read SSH keys, passwords, and secrets for this web service. You're then able to pivot and just completely compromise like any .ai TLD, uh, domain TLD. Um, and it's kind of funny because I think like uh, a lot of the work uh, kind of like this small group will do, it ends up being uh, a very specific vulnerability where you kind of have to have background of the actual like context to understand the impact of it because if, if if you know if you went up to someone on the street and you're like hey we have a you know vulnerability in a registrar or something or it takes a little bit more context to like understand like you know pick any .ai domain or pick any whatever and you're able to just completely take it over so i think it's just always like kind of an interesting uh process to like find these issues but yeah that's just a blurb i think just to continue a little bit um well, something kind of funny that came up when we were looking at uh, files in the box, we actually found a script called upload-files-box-com.sh. And yeah, like as you'd expect, it's basically used to like upload like a full database to a box.com account for all the different TLDs. So even from the perspective of like, you know, you think you're at the top where you've compromised like one specific CCTLD, uh, you know, admin service, there's actually, you know, the actual CACA or COCCA provider which is connected to every single CCTLD, where you're then able to pivot to the actual box account of this provider. And then instead of you know compromising one massive CCTLD at once, you're compromising like a dozen at once, right? And it's just like a massive amount of impact from like this one file. And you can see here, just like all these CCTLDs that just all their data is just being backed up on this box.com account from like these credentials on the, on the device, which was just kind of wild to see. Yeah, and and all of these backups were in plain text. So this this zip you could just extract, and you'd get access to all the databases. Um, and once you get access to the database, you'd be able to pretty much compromise the administrative user on these EPP uh, web applications for Coca. And once you've done that, as Vince said earlier, we'd be able to control any domain for that CCTLD. So um, yeah, it's it's quite a huge impact, and you know that's something that um, I was really really surprised about when we did this research of how how centralized a lot of this is and how critical this infrastructure is um, and how fragile it is at the same time. So that pretty much concludes uh, our adventure in hacking EPP servers. Now, this was a relatively short presentation. It doesn't necessarily um, explain all of the work that we had to do for many months of researching this, but in many ways, it really proves the impact. It's pretty much game over. Once administrative access is gained to the Cocker application, pretty much game over for any domain that's being managed by that registry. You can transfer the domains, you can you know, change the name servers, you can do all sorts of things. So you know, we, we communicated all of this um, with all the EPP servers that were running the software. We also communicated with, with this with Cocker and individual CCTLDs as well. And this has now been patched in the latest Cocker software. So the internet is a little bit safer as a result of this research. Um, but just on that note, I think one last thing we want to mention is just the the impact that some of this has on the broader internet. Now, um, there are obviously individual cases where this has impact. If you can think about some of these CCTLDs we compromised, one of them was .ms. Um, so uh, if people are aware, Microsoft uses .ms uh, for their link shortener, aka .ms. Now we would have been able to compromise any 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 link that's going through that route um, by compromising the CCTLD and then the domain itself. Um, but yeah, um, generally we think that 
you know, this research has a lot more, a uh, lot more work to do. Um, to I think there's a lot more attack surface in Kaka. There's a lot more stuff that we can find. Um, but generally, we wanted to show everyone what we could do with application security research when it comes to owning CCTLDs. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Sam? Um, I think you covered like pretty much everything. But the yeah, the idea of like kind of this like uh, it's it's always really interesting. I, I'd love to see more from like the community of people. Just like uh, it'd be fun to make a list of like services or websites where it's like you know a single point of failure, you compromise it, it affects like everything. I think this is a good example of that. But like uh, I'd love to see like a more research like this moving forward, where like people are just you know. Hey, you know, if I do this and I do this in this way, then like all of a sudden, like a hundred million devices are just completely compromised. But yeah, super, super fun work. Um, I think you covered everything. Okay, sweet. Yeah, well, I think I think that's all. Um, thanks everyone for coming to our NahamCon presentation. I hope you enjoyed our presentation, and we'll be releasing a blog post on this shortly as well. So we'll we'll tweet that out on Twitter, which will have a bit more information about the process of finding these vulnerabilities and 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 how we did what we did. Thanks everyone. See ya. Awesome.